Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Pediatric Ophthalmology Grand Rounds. Um, we have a few cases to present for you today. And uh, Lydia is going to start with a case of oculopalatal myoclonus and uh, the difficulties in its treatment. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is just a brief introduction to the case that Dr. Dries is going to present later on. And I kind of want to start with if you suddenly saw the world differently out of nothing, how would that influence you and your daily life? And I just want us all to think about that. If we would have one day where we wake up and suddenly we can't see single, we just have double vision. So with that, I want to start presenting a 36 year old man who had only a past medical history of hypertension, who suffered an acute hemorrhagic uh, central pontine stroke in August of 2021. And he noticed afterwards that he had horizontal dip diplopia, which was worse when he was looking to the right or the left. He also had a lot of other issues amongst difficulty with speech and swallow, difficulty with ambulation, ataxia, uh, diminished sensation and weakness. And the horizontal diplopia would be kind of like that picture of the coffee cup um, on the lower, lower right here. So he doesn't have any past medical history or past surgical history aside from, as I said, hypertension. He was hospitalized after his stroke and then in rehab for two months. Doesn't have any family history of eye diseases or strabismus. And he is a former smoker, but he has quit. On CT imaging, and you can see how it's just scrolling through here. This is his initial scan from uh, August of 2021. He had that very large hemorrhagic stroke in that pontine area. And here is another scan of his uh, initial CT imaging where we can also see that big area that is affected um, by the stroke. Prior to presenting to ophthalmology clinic, he also got an MRI imaging, which uh, kind of showed that these old lesions in the pontine area that was a couple months after his stroke, um, but nothing else that was abnormal. And here is, uh, again, uh, another uh, view of the MRI scan from that same time. So as we know, in that area that is affected by, uh, by a stroke, there are a lot of cranial nerves that uh, kind of exit uh, the brain to move towards the eye, including um, the sixth cranial nerve here. And so it's not a surprise that he demonstrated to a ophthalmology clinic in December of 2021. Um, he saw Dr. Warner, and at that time, his visual acuity was 2040. He had full Ishiara color plates. His pressures were normal. Pupils were normal. Visual fields were full to confrontation. And he had a normal anterior and posterior segment exam. However, his stereo, uh, stereo vision was uh, completely gone. And um, he had a large isotropia of about 40 diopters with bilateral horizontal gaze palsy with disconjugant uh, adeduction nystagmus of the right eye on left gaze, uh, which is a right eye and O, um, which corresponds to a pontine lesion. He also had pendular and rotary uh, vertical nystagmus uh, that became large amplitude on down gaze as well as a horizontal high frequency and low amplitude nystagmus of the left eye on left gaze. And his cranial nerve exam was otherwise unremarkable. So the options of possible strabismus surgery were discussed at that time, but the plan was to wait for at least six months and then to reevaluate uh, and remeasure the deviation. However, he presented sooner than six months in, August, in April of 2022, when his vision suddenly became a lot more blurrier and more overlapped. So he said that the doubling would use, but it was just more overlapped from the images. And his wife also noticed very severe vertical movements of the eyes. Um, an MRI scan that he'd gotten in March showed an inferior olivary hypertrophy. Um, his visual acuity on that visit was 2200. He was not able to perform any color or stereopsis testing. His pupils were still normal. His visual field still full and his lid lamp exam is still normal. Um, and his eye movements had improved in horizontal gauge, but now he had this very rapid vertical oscillation with synchronous head bobbing. And he didn't have any palatal tremor, 
which is something that is highlighted in this video that can sometimes be seen in this condition. Trying to advance. So this is oops. this is his clinical exam, just uh, an image of the eye movements that he's had, um, which are very severe and probably even worse compared to the videos I showed in the beginning of uh, just distorted vision because uh, we could not measure anything or look at the fundus at all, and he was severely uh, alter, uh, affected by this. So let's talk about this syndrome a little bit. Ocular palatal myoclonus is an acquired syndrome that um, has includes continuous and rhythmic mov movements of the soft palate combined with pendulum nystagmus and occurs after an injury of the brainstem or the cerebellar regions, and it's affecting the dentato rubro olivary tract, which is located in the Eulerian molary triangle, which is shown in the image right here. Um, it's typically a delayed complication of a brainstem lesion, so it occurs between three weeks and 49 months after the initial insult, but typically within six to eight months, which is where our patient presented as well. And the frequency, even among patients with brainstem stroke uh, lesions, is very, very low. So this is very uncommon. Um, here's the MRI imaging from our patient. And again, I'm not a, a neuroradiologist, but I try to find a scan that shows the uh, olivary uh, hypertrophy. And it was uh, this determined that he has that oculopalatal tremor as a late consequence of the pontine hemorrhage that is now dramatically worsened. Um, so talking about that lesion in the dentato rubro olivary tract, um, it is associated with that enlargement of the inferior olivary nuclei. Um, the tract passages... Um, I have described here, it originally originates in the cerebellar dentate nucleus, and then it uh, goes via the superior cerebellar peduncle um, into the contralateral red nucleus and to the ipsilateral olivary nucleus via the central te uh, tegmental tract. And damage in that central tegmental tract area causes that enlargement of the inferior olive, which is believed to cause the syndrome. Um, it can be bilateral in some cases resulting then in bilateral oculopalatal myoclonus. And the bilateral form tends to show peduncular movements, whereas the lateral, uh, unilateral form uh, may have more a rotary uh, component. And the MRI and oculopalatal myoclonus can help to confirm the diagnosis by showing this inferior olivary enlargement. And patients uh, with that syndrome, as I mentioned before, are often severely uh, debilitated with uh, and have poor mobility. Um, there are a lot of pharmacology agents that have been tried in this condition, and the success is very variable. And here's just a list of different options that were mentioned in studies, such as the one that I've highlighted here, which is a very good review article in this condition. Ocular dampening using contact lenses uh, in conjunction with high plus power spectacles has been tried, and botulinotoxin injections into the muscles or into the retroboba space uh, can also sometimes be a benefit. Surgery can be performed to try to decrease nystagmus, but um, it's not really frequently used. And so uh, Dr. Warner's statement in the end of this visit was, unfortunately, there's no cure for this kind of abnormal eye movement, and the disorder tends to be very refractory to medication. However, he already had, luckily, an appointment set up with Dr. Dries, which uh, he was recommended to keep. And with that, I'm going to hand the word over to Dr. Dries. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and good morning. Acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, Julie Harmon, our orthoptist. Julie, I could not do this job without you. I am so grateful for all the hard work you give us in our clinic. Um, you're doing 50% of the work at least. And then also uh, a um, 
really need to acknowledge Dr. Steve Archer at the University of Michigan, who's been extraordinarily generous with what to do and how to do it for multiple cases in my practice. And, uh, and indeed, when uh, this patient came to me, this is a new entity for me and a, and a great challenge. And I didn't formulate what I'm about to show you. I didn't know how to do it. Steve Archer formulated the procedure, did it, figured out how to do it. He shared all that with me. And I'm excited to share it with you because I think this particular procedure seems to make significant progress for these patients. So I think there is some hope for these patients. Um, unfortunately, without treatment, it's pretty much just close your eyes. And imagine the world bouncing with that um, abnormal eye movement. It'd be terrible. He also had eusotropia with this and some diplopia, but the main thing for him was the oscillopsia that, uh, that nystagmus created. Now, the, the literature on surgery is pretty dismal. Most of the reports say what we did didn't work well. Um, two procedures have been tried. The, the first is just disinserting the superior and inferior recti and sewing Tenon's capsule over the stump in the hopes that they don't reattach to the globe. Uh, that was reported as not, not much improvement, especially in the long term. And eventually, uh, botulinum into the muscle cone was offered, and one patient declined. One patient did that, but not much more follow up. The second was 11 millimeter recession of both vertical recti. And I don't know the precise uh, procedure that was done. This was in 1980. I had trouble getting that article for the details. Well, in any case, here he is pre op. And then the center video is about two days post-op. He had to be admitted because of an aspiration pneumonia. And so he, he looks about the same. In upgaze, he can control it better. But then about six months after his surgery, here's the video. And there's really a lot of improvement in, in uh, the abnormal eye movements. And he can voluntarily control it. So he's starting to watch television and um, can look people in the eye much better. Uh, he still has some diplopia, but with prism, that's that's improved. Um, so what's this procedure that Steve Archer um, came up with and why am I presenting it? Well, I'm hopeful that this will be on the internet on Morancor for the world. Uh, Steve tried to publish this years ago with a case series of six cases, but it was not published because he didn't have eye movement recordings. He just had video. Uh, and... Um, the idea here is a supermaximal recession of the superior rectus and the inferior rectus. So the muscles go way back on the globe. In fact, think of it as taking the insertion of the superior rectus and the inferior rectus and just putting it on the backside of the globe. And, and of course, the, the torque arm of, of rotation of the eye is very small and equal between those two muscles. And in addition to that, we think that the orbital muscle pulley causes the muscle to reflect backwards. It turns the superior rectus goes back like this on the eye because of the orbital muscle pulleys. Now, why does this help? I don't know. It must dampen the eye movements. Uh, but uh, in a way, I, I'd like to know why it works, but it doesn't matter to me. It, it seems to help. Uh, we typically recess. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm getting there too. So the typical recession for a superior rectus is what's called a hangback recession. Look, if you're recessing the superior rectus five, eight millimeters, you can't sew into the globe because the superior oblique tendon is in the way. The superior rectus is over the superior oblique tendon, so you cannot sew into the superior oblique tendon. You'll you'll change the 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 function of the, of the superior oblique muscle if you do that. And so the solution to that is to throw scleral tunnels at the native insertion and just let the muscle hang back. But that can't be trusted because you don't know exactly where that's going to reattach to the globe. Uh, and I think this is the procedure that's been done in the past in the superior rectus, but I don't know that for certain. Um, so with the hang back, you can see the suture just hangs back the superior rectus. And this is a, a schematic of the same thing where the muscle uh, overlies the superior oblique and it scars down there and we get good results with that for vertical deviations and dissociated vertical deviation. Um, 
But here's the thing with these large recessions, 12 millimeters, way, way back, you need to sew the superior rectus down underneath the superior oblique tendon. That's what makes this so tricky. And that's why I'm presenting it so that uh, Mimi and, and Srav and all of our younger partners, you know, you might see this once in a career. So you can refer back to this for uh, pearls on techniques. But this is where the superior rectus is going to go with an average insertion of the superior oblique underneath from behind. And um, if the superior oblique tendon is more anterior, you end up sewing just behind that tendon. And if the superior oblique tendon is more posterior, you might be sewing in front of the tendon. There's one other important thing. The, the superior oblique pulls on a line from its native insertion of the globe to the orbital apex. It does not pull directly posterior towards the posterior apex of the globe. And with these large recessions, if you go directly posterior, you're actually causing a kink in the muscle. So the superior rectus has to be nasally transposed by four to five millimeters while you do this. The inferior rectus, of course, is way less tricky because the inferior oblique's normal anatomy just puts it out of the way for the surgery and the inferior rectus. Well, as you can imagine, this is really tricky to go back 12 millimeters on the superior rectus and then nasally transposing. You're, you're sewing right next to the vortex veins they're very much in the way. Uh, you, you need great exposure with an experienced assistant, a headlamp because you're working in a pole. The superior rectus is the tricky one in particular. You need to dissect the frenulum, the, the fascia that is between the undersurface of the superior rectus and the top surface of the superior oblique so that when you do this recession, you don't disturb the superior oblique. You need to dissect the superior rectus back very far get all of its attachments off of it so you don't end up with um, uh, a complication of a, of a iatrogenic strabismus. Um, and beware the vortex veins, they're right there. Uh, and once those bleed, it's usually uh, kind of difficult. So I'll stop there uh, and just simply say this procedure, for whatever reason, is improving this single patient, Steve Archer has the same experience and it's not published. And, and, I, and I think what is published is kind of giving a dismal prognosis, but maybe it's better than that. So I'll stop there, see if there's any question or discussion. Yeah, Randy. No. Yeah, instead of Yeah, um, maybe you could help with that, Randy. Um, it, well, let me. Steve's ha has six, he's done video, but he didn't have. Yeah, I think at the time Steve 
tried to publish it, the nystagmus eye muscle surgery gurus really insisted on the eye movement recordings. And so that was the why it didn't get published. I understand. So Judith. Many of the yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, Well, I think uh, we could perhaps help them. The, the one somewhat cautionary note is I'd say that post-op video is about six months out. Maybe we'll see it one year, two years, uh, if it's, you know, stable or worsens. Do you mean the degree of excursion? I don't know. I just have the video, Judith. Yeah, so... Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. His range of motion. Uh, I, I, I don't have his uh, strabismus exams up. I, I don't recall. I do know he had about, Julie, if you remember, he had about like eight prison doctor esotropia left over and he liked prison and we put him in prison. No. I, I just told them, let's see what we can do about the oscillopsy and then go back on the horizontals, worrying about anterior segment ischemia. In, in my view, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question. I think the surgery is not, don't, it's not a try this at home kind of procedure. Uh, you know, I think I, I uh, probably, uh, my blood pressure was probably 155 over 100 during that case. Cause I mean, Judith, you're way back there deep in a hole. The vortex veins, the optic nerve is right there. I mean, I, I mean, like Boopy might feel a little bit better with his optic nerve sheath fenestrations, but for me, I'm like, Whoa. so uh, I think pulling in the, 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 the experienced team of surgeons is, is the way to go. And at least that's how I view it. But anyway, th okay. So in, in, in the interest of time, I'll go through this case quickly so Mimi has sufficient time. This patient, um, is an Iraqi interpreter who came to the United States thinking that I'm out of Iraq, thank God. Uh, but unfortunately he had a bad complication after bilateral maxillary and ethmoid sinus surgery that was done endoscopically where there was um, 
on the left, the, the surgeon went through the orbital wall and, and uh, orbital hemorrhage uh, occurred intraoperatively. There was proptosis. Uh, the ENT surgeon did a lateral canthotomy and cantholysis and then went back and tried to tamponade and uh, I think cauterize to stop the hemorrhage. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, postoperatively, he uh, had diplopia, he had medial rectus paralysis. And uh, this photo is when I saw him weeks later. So he looked worse than this initially. Two days after that procedure, an orbital surgeon and the ENT surgeon went back and attempted a repair of what they thought was a transected medial rectus. And with that surgery, uh, the patient said his binocular horizontal diplopia didn't change, but torsion was added. Uh, he, th his surgeries also were complicated by uh, optic atrophy and a branch retinal artery collusion. Past medical history is just is a type two diabetes. So he, he, he may have been a vasculopath. In any case, here's his business exam. Uh, he can, he can bring this exotropia together with great effort and extreme left gaze, uh, but you can see he does not adduct this eye well at all. And he's got uh, extorsion in, in his left eye, uh, but there's no vertical deviation here, but there's extorsion. So um, here's a video of his floating saccades. So when he looks towards his nose, the eye kind of floats over. It doesn't go briskly over. And that's a sign that it's a paretic muscle, but he does have some medial rectus function. Um, so at this point, you know, what surgical approach do we have for the least unhappy ending? It's kind of hard to get a very happy ending here. Um, and I want to bring up repeat orbitotomy. Um, we, ENT surgeons, I think, rush to try to repair this, but maybe that's not the best course. And I asked Boopy to come to just kind of address that because he, he helped me with this case as well. And thank you, Boopy, for helping me with this case. Boopy, could you talk about this case? What your impression? Uh, visual acuity was quite good, you know, 2025. Yeah, he did have some field loss from his branch retinal uh, artery occlusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we see these once every couple of years. They, it's not a common complication, but it's a dramatic complication. And the thing to remember is not to go into the orbit acutely because the injury is not to the muscle only, but the optic nerve, the vessels, and more importantly, the nerve to the medial rectus. So when you try and reattach the muscle, you cause secondary trauma and you get a superior oblique involvement, you get the optic nerve involvement. So it's best to quieten these down. And about 50% of them will show some spontaneous improvement if the muscle is not completely transected. So these days we do a dynamic MRI to see if there are any attachments between the proximal and the distal so-called cut part of the muscle, and frequently there will be um, a continuity of the muscle. If there is, then you wait at least three to four months, await recovery, and all attempts at reattaching these muscles so far, uh, I did another review last night, including our six patients uh, that we initially tried to repair have been unsuccessful. So you do not try and reattach this. Now, you can try and do a hangback to try and get some degree of, some degree of medial um, stability. And there you can also do a fixation to the bone itself to hold the eye in um, a deduction. As far as the types of injuries, the commonest is a partial transection of the medial rectus. The next is a complete transection. And the majority of them will also have involvement of the optic nerve. So this gentleman had a partial transection, and I think further exploration just leads to more risk in his case. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, so the eye muscle surgeon comes in, and the question is what eye muscle surgery to do. And uh, I can tell you what, what I did, uh, but the, the main decision point is whether to do a recession resection of the lateral rectus and the medial rectus, thinking that there's enough medial rectus function that if you resect it, it'll actually get the eye midline. 
And uh, with that floating saccade, that really tells us that there's significant paralysis to the muscle and probably a transposition procedure is needed. And uh, so the initial procedure that I did, and this is a, a rocky road that this guy went through going, going back to the operating room a couple of times, but eventually we got the least unhappy ending. Uh, so here's the procedure, it's partial. Well, let me back up. So the medial rectus presumably was transected enough that there's no blood supply to the anterior segment from the medial rectus. So you've already got one muscle gone to maintain blood flow to the anterior segment. So you're already worried about anterior segment ischemia with cataract and uh, atrophy problems. Um, and so a partial vertical rectus transposition rather than a full vertical rectus transposition of both the superior and in inferior recti is, is what I did. And uh, when you're transposing uh, to the medial rectus, you really have to resect some muscle. There's not enough adducting mechanical force without resecting muscles. So four millimeter resection, and then bringing those muscle halves down here. Now, presumably, that does not help his torsion. Presumably. So I did a Harada Ito procedure, moving part of the superior oblique tendon down to the lateral rectus to bring that left eye and crank it to in toward that eye. Um, and, and, and here he was. So his alignment is really a lot better in primary gaze. He still has an adduction deficit with a bit better adduction, still has an AB and has an abduction deficit. By the way, the lateral rectus was recessed nine millimeters. I should have added that. I apologize. That's why he's got an abduction deficit here because he had a super maximal recession of the lateral. Um, but uh, oh dear, he went to 20 degrees of in torsion. So his left eye went from here to here. Oh dear. So uh, I took him back to the operating room and recessed the Harada Ito by nine millimeters. And we got some uh, improvement, but not a lot right away, but not a lot. And so I took him back to the operating room again I repositioned the Harada Ida back to where it came from because apparently he didn't need that. And I recessed the inferior rectus partial vertical transposition a bit. If you think about that, that'll give you less intorsion, right? If you take that muscle, put it back, that's going to extort a little. And uh, before that procedure, he looked up at me and he said, you know, Dr. Dries, I think you got it this time. I think it's going to work. And, and he was right. So that's a patient who got partial improvement, taking him back over and over again to the OR. And uh, I guess the reason I'm presenting it is um, just pearls. You, you may not see this in your career, you know, or you may, uh, not very often, but here are the pearls. This happens, floating saccades and four, four first generations in the clinic tell you if you need a transposition. Um, interestingly to me, I really learned something that if you, transpose vertical recti, that apparently takes care of torsion for you. That kind of locks in the eye where it's supposed to be with regard to torsion, apparently. And I'm very fussy about force ductions, trying to make sure that the force ductions for torsion are equal. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, he, he, I had to reverse the, some of these procedures. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So I learned the most from the cases that don't turn out so well. And I'm gonna share two of those with you today. So this is a 73 year old woman who came in with constant double vision. She's had it for the last seven years. She tried using a Fresnel prism, but it didn't really help um, how it blurred her vision. So she's just been walking around with a patch on. The cause of her double vision is thought to be from neurosarcoid. She had been referred by neuro-ophthalmology. She'd had a biopsy in Singapore previously. Uh, 
and had been followed by MRI. And the last one was three weeks prior to me seeing her. And she'd been treated with immunosuppression for this neurosarcoid. Uh, it had caused some uh, optic atrophy, especially in that left eye. Um, and she had a little mild APD. She was a little bit uh, nearsighted. And had an esotropia with some limited movement on the left. Um, little, uh, pretty similar distance in near, had no stereo, um, color vision was normal. But as you can see, I can't even get that left eye to midline um, when she's trying to look in. Um, also doesn't fully seem to, um, yeah, can't pull that can't pull that eye out, sorry. Also can't pull it all the way in. So she's just got some limited motility. Uh, so her biggest issue I, I thought was her um, esotropia. So I decided that I was going to treat that with a right, um, sorry, that should say left, but um, Uh, superior rectus transposition, as well as a medial rectus recession on an adjustable suture. So I was going to move um, that superior rectus all the way over towards her lateral to try to get that left eye to move. It, that should be say left, sorry. Get that left eye to move out and just, and then also recess that medial on an adjustable. While I was in the case, I um, went after the medial first and um, hooked to the medial and thought, wow, this really isn't that tight and uh, uh, handed it to the assistant and thought, wow, that's kind of got a lot of give on it. And all of a sudden she pulled the hook up and it was in two. Um, so this was the medial, not the lateral, which was the paretic muscle. Um, and this is something that I had seen in fellowship, but hadn't since then, um, what we call pulled in two, muscle, pulled in two syndrome. So. This is where the uh, rectus muscle is pulled in two pieces, and it's usually where the tendon attaches to the muscle. So this is, a, this is an article looking at pulled and sued syndrome that was done by David Granite at UCSD. Um, and um, he found that most patients have a pre-existing condition, um, either a previous surgery or a cranial nerve palsy were the most common, but can also be seen in thyroid disease. Scleral buckle is pretty much previous surgery. Um, and two had no underlying conditions. So our, our patient did fit into that uh, category of, of having a cranial nerve palsy or having some kind of other disease. Um, uh, 70 were over 50 years of age. So it tends to go with a little bit older of age. They looked at it and thought it was a little more likely to happen with a green hook than a Stevens hook. And that's a picture of a green hook there. And I don't know if that's just because many of us use green hooks or, or not, but Stevens hook is that small little hook. Um, most of the time, uh, it's possible to retrieve that proximal end so that the, you know, the end on the other side and reattach it. However, in this series, 30% couldn't be retrieved. And uh, some ended up undergoing a transposition later. Um, but a large number of them didn't, didn't need any reoperation, which is pretty remarkable. Most of the time, it happens to the medial or inferior rectus. Um, and I've also listed here where, uh, where most of those points of insertion are, points of rupture from insertion. Um, and they kind of line up with where that tendon, you know, how long that tendon is and, and where it, it attaches to the muscle there. So it's usually at that same, that same spot because the uh, medial rectus has a four and a half millimeter length of a tendon and goes right in that space of four to six millimeters. So it really does rupture right there where the medial um, where the tendon meets the muscle. From this study, they anticipated that, or they conjecture, you know, that most people who are doing a lot of strabismus surgery are going to have one case in the, one case of this every ten years or so. So um, after the case, um, uh, just thinking a little bit more about it, um, I so after that muscle pulled in two, I called Bob and he came and we together were able to find the end of the muscle and pull it back. Um, and reattach it. It was for, it seemed a little bit further back than where I would have expected, you know, than that four and a half millimeters to where I would have expected that it to pull the, from the tendon to the muscle. And um, I just was curious more about her neurostarcoid disease, which I hadn't fully researched prior to the surgery. 
um, and went back and looked and found that um, this is her MRI looking at her inferior uh, that sh she had um, some thickening of the inferior rectus and the medial rectus right near the orbital apex there. And um, I don't have as good of images as, uh, but you can see that they're pretty thickened back here. So we have some abnormal muscles to begin with. And I think that that probably contributed somewhat to them being weak. And I think it ruptured more posteriorly than the, where the tendon inserts because of this inflammation that was still, um, uh, you know, still happening. And this was the MRI that was just a few weeks prior to me doing surgery. Um, you can see there's some serious enhancement there right before it, uh, the muscles get meet in the muscle cone. So um, after, that, after that happened, I didn't end up um, transposing the superior rectus because I was just a little bit traumatized by losing that muscle. Um, and uh, saw her a few weeks later. She was, as you recall, was an ET of about 40 prior to surgery. After she was about 30, she can still fuse if she gets a pretty big head turn, but not a whole lot better. So I did take her back to the OR um, uh, a few weeks later and um, did that transposition. And here are her photos afterwards. Um, you can see that she is still, um, you know, somewhat limited, you know, still has some limited adduction here. Whoa. But she's looking much straighter than 40 prism diopters of esotropia. Um, and she's still quite limited here. Uh, may, you know, she can't get to midline now before she had was a minus six, so couldn't completely get to midline, um, but now can. You can also see that she's, you know, somewhat limited on her up and down gaze here. And about one month after her surgery, she was down to about an ET of 10, could fuse with just a little bit of head movement. And looking more at her vertical movements, I hadn't concentrated so much on those before, but um, I think, yeah, she still has some limited up and down gaze there, which I had probably missed before because I was more just concerned about her ET and hadn't really looked as much at her up and down gaze. But this is probably somewhat limited by that thick inferior rectus muscle. So in thinking about more about this case, um, I mean, I, I didn't review the scan before. I just kind of thought she would, you know, she'd been stable for many years. She had had the same esotropia for many years um, and it hadn't changed for her report. And I didn't fully go back and look at that scan. And if I had, I might be a little bit more uh, gentle or, or I've thought a little about the case a little bit different um, knowing that. Um, I also had a brand new tech who wasn't familiar in the OR um, and just kind of handed her the muscle like she knew what she was doing. And I think she pulled a little bit harder than she should have. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately I'm the one who's responsible there. But uh, just all of these, all of these things kind of, led together to me pulling that muscle in too. Um, but these are the cases that I end up, you know, you think about and go back and kind of reevaluate um, and uh, realize the mistakes you made. And um, anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah. He kind of took over, as you can imagine. The other interesting thing to me was that um, 
and I'm just trying to go back here, but. A fair amount of these are the, uh, of the people with cranial nerve palsies, three were the paretic muscle and three were the anta antagonist muscle. And I thought that was interesting because I would have thought that the one I would pull in two would be that, would be that, uh, you know, would be the paretic lateral. Um, but it's all, it's often the, and I don't know if you're pulling harder because it's a tight muscle or if it's an abnormal muscle or, but a fair amount of the time it's the, it's the one that's tight that you're pulling into. I thought that was interesting. But hers was likely related to her inflammation there. But um, also just, you know, you have a new scrub tech. You don't, you know, sometimes I, I don't always communicate as well with them. Um, some of these guys aren't always trained to hold the muscle. They're more, you know, they do a lot more cataract surgery than they do these muscle cases. And uh, I just, you know, that second before I thought that muscle is kind of loose. <laughs> I just wish I'd grab, grab that muscle, but happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because sometimes they're like moving the muscle things, and it doesn't matter most of the time, but here it, it did. So, yeah, because you don't always know how hard you're pulling if you're, and they don't always know because they haven't done that many of these. But um, I have one other quick case here. Do I have time? I don't even know what time it is. You got time. So, this is a 22 year old girl who came in with an intermittent exotropia. So, she was getting some intermittent double vision, didn't like it, had had it since high school. Um, recently got married and just wanted to fix. So on exam, she's 2020, has good stereo, just has this intermittent exotropia, run of the meal, a little bit more at year, um, but uh, pretty not that poorly controlled, great vision. So I took her to the OR and did what I usually do, which is a bilateral lateral resection, recession for these. So I move that muscle back so the eye can come in a little bit more. And I often do, I usually in adults will do these uh, as an adjustable suture. So I put that little noose knot there and can move it post-op if I need to. If they're a little bit undercorrected on day one, they're gonna be a lot under undercorrected in a, <laughs> in a couple months. So it's kind of nice to have this and some of them are controlling better than others. And so um, especially these young women, not so much the young men can sit and um, uh, in the office, will let you adjust them. So I you know, passed the sutures at the insertion, um, did my adjustable noose knot, everything seemed fine, no concerns at all. Saw her back post-op day two. She said she had some soreness when using her peripheral vision. Had a little bit of XT, which I didn't adjust, but thought it would be uh, okay. Um, she said she's a little light sensitive, but nothing to run of the mill. Um, and then about a week after, you know, after surgery, she called in and talked to the on-call resident. Um, she said she has a little bit of increased bruising in her eye and she has some more floaters. Um, you know, the resident told her maybe she should come up. She lived in Provo, didn't really want to drive up. Um, and uh, I actually, and uh, so I saw her the next day in clinic, which seemed appropriate to me because I haven't had too many of these problems. And usually these young people complaining of problems don't have them. Um, and she, on her dilated exam, she did have a little bit of vitreous hemorrhage and a little bit of temporal choroidal whitening and a little elevation of the choroidal pigment in that left eye. Still was 2020. Um, you know, she was probably just getting a few, a little bit of that vitreous hemorrhage in her middle where she was, you know, moving a little bit where she was seeing a little bit of blurry vision. But um, I talked to her about the options. She lived in Provo. She had been to see, you know, in the same office, was referred to us as one of the retina doc down there. So followed up down there. Uh, he saw, oh, talk a little bit about uh, this. So clearly I perforated the, uh, you know, uh, the eye passed a deep suture. How often does this happen? More than we think. Um, uh, you know, the incidence is difficult to determine because we don't look at every patient and most of them don't have problems, so we don't worry about it. Um, if you look at a lot of these kids who you've done surgery on, sometimes you'll see a little bit of a pigment or, or, or little things temporally or, or uh, on some of your post-ops. But, um, uh, you know, this clearly, I didn't go through the retina, but I, you know, penetrated enough to cause some, some bleeding there. Uh, this is a study that looked at 300 uh, 
uh, cases where they found 13 penetrations and six perforations. This was at UCLA and probably a little bit more because I think a lot of the uh, fair amount of these were done by residents. So, um, but they didn't have any real complications. Um, happened a little bit more in recession than resection, which would mean that, that more when they were passing that suture further back, a little more likely to happen with horizontal muscles, but we also do those more likely um, and more likely with that S24 needle, a little bit bigger needle. Um, of these people, none of them had retinal detachments. If they were followed for a year, no M.thalmitis. Um, one maybe had a little bit of a scotoma caused by some uh, cryo that was maybe that was done at the time. Um, some had some retinal edema. A um, little bit more likely when they were doing a posterior fixation suture, putting a suture into the sclera far back. Um, this is another study that was done in uh, Saudi Arabia, looking at. 4,000 surgeries, they found 15 perforations, pretty low percent, um, and not many, uh, no loss of best corrective visual acuity. Um, most of them are treated with laser. There's, you know, uh, one of them was a kid with high myopia who needed a scleral patch crash. Some were more likely with the sharp Westcott's. So, uh, so it happens more than we think, doesn't usually have, you know, too many uh, devastating consequences, but um, certainly something to be aware of. Um, so she went down, my patient, back to my patient, she went down to that group in Provo, they saw a little bit of a choroidal hemorrhage temporally, did not think she had a retinal detachment, didn't think that that any, couldn't see any abnormality in the retina at all, didn't have any submetal fluid, they put a little laser in there just to protect her. And I didn't think about it much, and then about a month Later, I got a call from that retina group again saying that her vision was down to count fingers. Um, so her, she had a big enough choroidal hemorrhage in there that she had not, that it had now broken through into the vitreous. And she was, um, uh, so they recommended, and it didn't clear for another month. She was still count fingers. So they uh, decided to do a, um, a vitrectomy. So he did a 25 gauge vitrectomy. Um, just Typical setup had her trocars at the top and an infusion at the bottom. Um, post op day one, she was 2060. <laughs> Came back to see me a month after that, which was three months after her initial surgery. And I'd just like to point out her alignment's good. <laughs> we fixed the exotropia. Uh, but she's pretty bothered by this. She's 2040 now and was 2020. And I could refract her better, but now she's got some astigmatism and it's bugging her because she never needed glasses and she feels like now that eye is blurry. And so I don't know why that is. And I kind of looked through the literature. Um, uh, we do get it in strabismus surgery for sure, right after, and in most of these cases, they show some changes in refraction. Uh, this is a just a, and the, most of the series that they've done are similar to this, where right after surgery, yes, there are changes. And this one had a significant difference in refractive error, axial length, and corneal astigmatism at post-op day one, but it all cleared by post-op month one. Um, I know this because I had a patient that I did a big r, &R on a month ago, and he was beside himself because he's a stargazer, and I induced some astigmatism, and now he's got a halo. I said it would go away, and it did go away, but um, I don't know why after a after a 25 gauge protectomy that they didn't suit her. I don't know why she's got, or I don't know what happened, but she's um, and this is just more of a study saying that one day after surgery, there are some changes, but a month after there aren't. Um, retina people have any thoughts on that? No. And I looked through it. It sounds like it doesn't happen so much. So maybe it will settle. Hopefully it will settle. But now she's mad because her insurance is fighting the cost of her surgery. But um these are the cases that I, I learn the most from and think about the most from. Um, and uh, I think it's hard to share your complications. And I, um, where I trained, we did a lot of that. And uh, um, it's always hard to <laughs> admit that you screwed up, but I think, or that things didn't go as you had planned or you had hoped. But I think that talking together and, and I'd hope to present these at m, &M but my surgery schedule is always kind of hard. Um, those are the ways you learn the best and, and support each other and, 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 uh, grow from them. Dave.
Yeah. You got another comment there at the back? Yeah. Uh huh. No. None. Yeah, none that I could see. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't happy. Yeah. I haven't, no. That's a good thought, I could. Yeah. I don't always jump to thinking that because we don't have one that I saw. I see her at Riverton, but yeah, it would be in, it would be interesting. Yeah, and I always think about yeah. We I see it after strabismo surgery all the time, uh, like that stargazer guy, and and they get yeah, and it go and it goes away, but it's noticeable. And then it it can make us it can make your amblyopia worse if you do an R and R in a kid. So I I think about it a lot with strabismus, but I I hadn't yeah, I, and it may settle over time. She could be, she could be growing cataract. I didn't notice it then, but she'll be thrilled. <laughs> yeah, that's, she's, yeah. Thank you everybody.